Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul. Hopefully you're having an amazing day. The next generation of processors from AMD and Intel is almost here. And we actually have a benchmark result of the i9-13900K. And this is actually from Geekbench, so it's a relatively acceptable benchmark. We'll get into the results in just a second. But first, just a quick reminder that this processor is going to be launched later this year, and the 3900K is going to support 32 threads with 24 real cores. This is, of course, because the number of energy-efficient cores has doubled over that of the 12900K, but they do not support hyper-threading or multi-threading or whatever you want to say. Now, the motherboard um, situation is also quite interesting. Obviously, you've got the 700 series board, which is going to launch. However, this processor is going to be backwards compatible with the 600 series boards and presumably vice versa. And in this particular case, we are actually looking at the board most unlikely being tested with a, with a 600 series board with a caveat. We'll get into what that caveat is in just a second. But yes, um, it's being tested with a ROG Maximus Z690. So it's a pretty high-end board, quite nice. So as for the clock frequency, this thing is absolutely ripping through in terms of clock frequency. We've got a base frequency of three gigahertz and the boost here is up to 5.5. I've actually heard that it can even go higher than that, but obviously this is not final silicon and naturally a lot of the rumors at the moment are kind of contradicting one another. So the obvious thing I'm sure most of you are going to be drawing your eyes to is the, well, this benchmark result is invalid due to issues with the timers on the system. I'm going to get into what this means in just a second and the caveats, but let's have a look at the results first. So 2133 for single core and around 23,700 for multi-core. So this is, well, let's just say pretty fast. A number of Twitter users have already been doing some comparisons. To give you an idea, it's around 40% faster than a 5950X, with the usual you know, caveats of it depends on the system configuration, PBO, memory timings, the angle of the sun and the moon, the time of the day, whatever. Comparing it, however, against a lower-end processor like the 5800X, again, we're looking at around a 23% increase in single uh, core performance. However, multi-thread, we've got 120%. And yeah, it's roughly speaking about 20% faster than the 12900K when it comes to single core results. Now, unfortunately, this is not a wide variety of benchmarks. Therefore, it's very difficult to ascertain things like, I don't know, uh, IPC gains. And because we do not know the, let's say, state of the BIOS, it becomes even trickier. So let's tackle them now, well, message, shall we? Now, there's a few possibilities here. The first is that this benchmark result is fake. So, yes, it's possible that someone just absolutely just, you know, was running us on a Pentium 4, obviously being a little silly, and then essentially faked the result. This can be done. I'm not going to get into the means and the methods because I don't want to really propagate that, but I am making you guys aware of it. Another possibility, um, and you can actually do a Google for this, res this exact message, and I'll try to remember to link uh, one of the results in the video description. But it can be caused by things like overclocking or software, at least according to the official website. Now, personally, I haven't run into this particular error message. Um, so I'm basing it on what the you know official website has said in the forums. And it can be quite a wide variety of different things, including the fact that beta BIOSes or whatever can cause it. So it's very possible that A, it's fake, or B, there's just something else hinky going on, like the BIOS or what have you. And basically, it's just like, oh God, what is going on? I will also add another thing, and that is this was being tested with Windows 10. Ideally, of course, you would want to run Windows 11 with this, but that's by the by. Either way, it is a pretty impressive result. And quite frankly, I am looking forward to seeing what Intel can pull out. Um, it's going to be very interesting, as I've said multiple times at the stage, to kind of compare it against what AMD are doing with Zen 4. 
I personally think that while these ranges of processors are interesting, I suspect many of us who have like a 12900K or a 5950X or whatever may not want to upgrade, um, depending on your budget. Obviously, if you've got tons of cash, then, you know, more power to you. But I think for people with more limited budgets, there's a very good possibility that people are going to want to just save their cash and throw it into an RTX 40 or an RDNA 3 based GPU. And this is actually something that I kind of missed a few days ago. I want to give credit to Tweaktown actually for um, uh, actually discovering this interview. Uh, it was actually with VentureBeat, so I will link them in the video description along with Tweaktown. So this was an AMD Senior Vice President Corporate Fellow, as well as Product Technology Architect, Sam Nefsiga. Hopefully I've pronounced that name correctly. If not, I apologize. There was a plethora of things that was being discussed here, and honestly, I'm not going to go into all of them because I will be here until Christmas. But one of the questions that was asked is, compared to NVIDIA and Intel, do you think that we're in a state of divergence when it comes to design or some type of convergence? Nafsiga said, and I quote, it's hard to speculate, NVIDIA certainly hasn't jumped on the chip lit, chip lit excuse me, bandwagon yet. We have a big lead there and see big opportunities in that. They'll be forced to do so, and when they deploy it, Intel certainly has the jump on that. Ponte Vico is the poster child for extreme chip lits. I would say it's more of a convergence than a divergence, but the companies that innovate in the space, the soonest gain an advantage. And if you see deliver on new technologies and much as what technology is, however, it's first with innovation has technologies. Now, it's worth noting, of course, that they were mentioning things like the Infinity Cache and a lot of the stuff that AMD has implemented. And to be honest, AMD have employed a very interesting strategy. Basically speaking, if you look at the multiple different designs, let's say Zen to Zen, let's not take the Zen 1 refresh, which of course was the you know, Ryzen 2000 series. So Zen to Zen 1 to Zen 3 and so on and so on. Each CPU anyway has had a multitude of different changes as they slowly went towards, let's say, chiplets. Well, first of all, of course, they uh, designed the CCX and they started to make changes to it. Then they started to implement chiplets. Uh, then we've got Vcache, and on the GPUs, of course, they went from the GCN architecture to the RDNA architecture, and then RDNA 1 went to RDNA 2, and they implemented things like, you know, hardware-based ray tracing, and of course, they implemented the Infinity Cache, and so on. So basically, they're continuing to evolve the design, and it's a very... It's an incremental process, so you can kind of infer, perhaps, what the next stage of AMD's strategy is going to be by A, looking at their current designs, B, looking at how this could be improved or evolved in the future, and then you can start looking at patents and other such things. And I think most of us knew for some time that AMD eventually would start to move into the chiplets even before we started to hear the leaks for GPUs, just because of the number of benefits that it provides. Not only, of course, better scaling in terms of power efficiency and so on, but just being able to bolt quote-unquote, stuff together just provides a lot of flexibility and it's great for custom designs as well. And I think that RDNA 3 is going to be a great step towards that. I've heard RDNA 4 is even more so, but yeah, that's slightly off topic. But another thing that was mentioned here <laughs> um, is it basically GPUs. Now, I'm sure everyone at this stage knows that RTX 40 and RX 7000 series are going to be kind of power hungry. You can see Navi 31 here. I'm hearing 375 watts is like the minimum, up to 450 for the AIB custom models. Now, I want to stress it could be higher or it could be lower because this is based on leaks, but I don't think it's going to be lower. In fact, I think AMD and Intel, uh, sorry, NVIDIA are going to be as um, let's say motivated is humanly possible to crank the frequencies as high as they can. Now, there are a couple of things, and before we get into what Nafsiga himself has said here, I have heard that AMD will be somewhat locking down overclocking for RDNA 3. I can't remember if I mentioned this previously, but I may as well throw it in here. Um, I'm not too confident on whether this is true. However, a couple of sources have both told me this, and I'm trying to do a bit more research. But basically, the higher-end SKUs apparently will have overclocking much like you've got now, but lower-end cards, you won't. Basically, it's automated overclocking like Rage Mode or what have you. 
So obviously that provides you a lot less flexibility. And this could be for a couple of reasons. I've heard different reasons for this, and I think they're more theories than actually solid information. The first is that it provides extra, well, basically separation between SKUs, but also there may be some technical reasons behind it, perhaps yields or connection to the uh, GCD, MCDs. I honestly don't know. And quite frankly, without things like block diagrams and so on, it becomes even harder to know. It's going to be very interesting, though, to see what direction they go. But what they did also mention is that, yeah, GPUs are just going to become more and more and more and more power hungry. 600 watts and so on. Um, and I think this is quite likely. You know, we've all seen what the RTX uh, 40 is most likely going to be aiming for. You know, the 4090, about 450 watts. And then there's overclocking. So even if you just bump the power limits of that, like even conservatively 10 or 15 or 20 percent, you could be looking at 500, 550 watts. And goodness knows what's going to happen with custom revision BIOSes and so on. It's going to be kind of nutty. I think it's going to be very cool, though, with that said. I mean, personally, I'm well, I guess it won't be cool. I guess it'll be very hot. But it's going to be interesting to at least see how all of this comes out. Um, as for the obvious thing, NVIDIA, yeah, RTX 40 is just not chiplet. Um, it's just not. Um, we all know, of course, it's a monolithic die. Blackwell may be chiplet. I'm hearing a lot of confusing things there, quite honestly. I've heard three different answers, and I do not know which one's right. The first is that Blackwell is definitely chiplet. The second is Blackwell is chiplet, but only for the highest end SKUs. And then the final one is Blackwell is not chiplet. So... I'm not sure which one's true. Um, I think that they are just testing designs. Obviously, even the RTX 40 at this moment, there is a lot of moving parts. It's going to depend on things like yields, production, and all this other stuff. So it's going to be very interesting. And another thing, of course, is ultimately, at the end of the day, NVIDIA are very competitive. And that's one of the reasons I suspect that this generation of GPUs from AMD and NVIDIA is going to be so interesting. Um, AMD definitely have more to gain because obviously their market share is just so small in comparison to NVIDIA. However, with that said, the good thing about um, RDNA 3 is it's going to be very, very scalable across multiple different power envelopes. And depending on ray tracing performance, we could see some very interesting things on, um, let's say, 10, 15, 20 watt designs eventually. Um, uh, yeah, I'll be very interested to see how all of that plays out. And the last thing I will quickly mention, I'm just going to blow over this real fast, um, because basically there's a plethora of PCI IDs that have emerged on the internet. Um, I want to give credit to Harakazi5719 on Twitter for this discovery. I'm not going to go into all of them because, quite frankly, I'll be here until Christmas. Um, the most obvious one is the AD102 is listed, which is the RTX 4090. And there are also numerous um, mobile GPUs. Now, there's a lot of confusion when the mobile parts will launch. I've personally heard it's going to be Q1. A possible candidate is, well, basically CES. Um, and I think that's when uh, AMD will be launching theirs, especially like Phoenix, for example. But obviously, all of the release dates and so on are just... Well... <laughs> Let's just let's just be honest, guys. They're all up in the air. And the, the really weird thing about this is that the, the IDs are actually a little earlier than what you would expect, actually, for the mobile lineup in particular. So I'm going to be very interested to see how all of this plays out. With that said, thank you very much for watching, and I will see you soon. Take care of yourselves. Have an amazing day. Bye for now.